All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bearded Gear podcast. This is episode number 14, and I think I'm going to officially call it Bearded Banter because today I am joined by the infamous uh, Ben Peterson or Ben Banters or what is up, guys, whatever you want to call him. Um, I think in the knife community, he has become pretty well known at this point uh, because of his history at Blade HQ and now as a knife designer and designer of products to go around knives and all kinds of stuff. So I've been really excited for this one. Ben, how are you, man? I'm so good, Jake. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Pleasure is all mine, dude. Um, so I imagine most people who will listen to this will probably have some idea of who you are, what you're about, kind of your story, if you will, because the people who listen to me are definitely in the knife community for the most part, I think. Um, but I do like to give my guests a moment to just kind of explain who they are, why knives for them, like how that came to be. If there's some kind of brief synopsis you can give us of who you are as a dude and, and why knives are a thing in your life. Yeah, definitely. So my brief synopsis is I kind of ended up in the knife industry professionally and sure. sort of got sucked into the vortex. So initially it was just a job. And then uh, here I am 10 years later, exactly 10 years, uh, having worked in the knife industry professionally for about eight and a half of those years. And then as a side hustle for the past uh, year and a half. So it's been super fun. I Why knives? I... I've said a couple of times in my Instagram, like you come for the knives and stay for the community. Just, and I, I believe that, like, I think this is a really cool community. Uh, it's, it's people that care about each other. It's people that enjoy chatting with each other. Uh, sure. You'll have your spats and stuff, but it is a super welcoming, genuine community. And something about that just, it draws you in and, and keeps you in. So yeah, that's makes story. it hard to leave for sure. So it does. For me, the first time that I was introduced to you virtually um, in terms of like learned who you were was from Blade HQ videos. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of people, because of Blade HQ's reach, that can be pretty formative as people are finding and discovering the knife hobby. If you're on YouTube or you're just Googling stuff about knives, a lot of what's going to come up is going to be Blade HQ. And uh this would have been a few years ago when I like got into the hobby and not just into knives blade HQ videos were some of what I like, what really pulled me in. How long were you at blade HQ and what exactly was like your role there? Or did you have multiple roles? How did that look over time? Yeah. Let me, let me answer your question with a question. When <laughs> did you first see your first blade HQ video? Probably. Let's think I would have been, working in an office job four years ago. Okay. Something so like that. 2017 ish. Perfect. Okay. So, so let's go off of your time frame. 2017 would have been Ben round two at blade HQ. Okay. So I started at blade HQ in 2011. Gotcha. Um, I was just tasked with, starting they had started a youtube channel i was hired as a full-time video man mm. and so 2011 i started i think there were 800 subscribers on the youtube channel and i think when we when i left in 2013 i think we'd grown it to just under a hundred thousand i think it was sitting at like 80 85 thousand which i was like ah oh, that's amazing yeah um so that was kind of round one at Blade HQ. And then I went to CRKT for mm -hmm. three years. So I was there until 2016. And then Blade HQ actually recruited me back for an gotcha. encore. Could we call it an encore? Let's call it an encore. Sure. <laughs> so when you came back to Blade HQ, I would assume the, the role was pretty different than it was the first time you were there. Yeah, it was. So the first time I was there as a video marketing specialist. So only doing YouTube, only doing video. And then when I came back, I was the marketing manager. And the mm. cool thing about that is I, I like to think of marketing as like you have this dashboard of, of levers and buttons you can push and pull. And in my first role at Blade HQ, I had this video lever. And I'm you like, the guy. <laughs> I'm like, come on, like, let's roll, you know. But what I realized is video is just one piece of this dashboard of buttons and switches and all these things. And so my time at CRKT really taught me like, hey, here's how you utilize video 
in an email marketing campaign or on a product detail page or like all of these different parts of marketing. And so when Blade HQ recruited me back, I had the whole dashboard and like, like it's mm. like Christmas lights, you know, it's like, whoa. And yeah. that's, I think that's really where the magic started to happen because we started, like I understood keywords better and I understood SEO and I understood all of these pieces and parts to drive a customer to the sale. And so everything we did was super calculated at Blade HQ the second time. And it, it makes me happy that we helped people like you get into knives because that was the goal. It was to be an accessible resource for people to learn about pocket knives and then eventually buy them from the person Blade HQ who's providing the information. Yeah. So sorry, that was a little deep, but uh, I have to like find yeah. out what, because there are people out there that, that dove into Blade HQ back in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, like there are a few that I, I keep in contact with still. And they're like, I remember when you put out this piece of crap video and I'm like, yeah, that was, that was me. <laughs> you should be able to look back at early videos and cringe at yourself. That's, that should be a rule. Because there's if you don't, then that means you ones. waited too long to start is, is kind of the way I look at it. Yeah, man, there's, there's some bad ones, but round two at Blade HQ was super cool to me because I, I was able to take everything I'd learned and really put it into practice mm -hmm. and it flew. It was, it was really magical. It was a cool period. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, I don't know. There was a, a certain flavor of like that era of, especially on YouTube, the essence that came through of you and that like small team that was around you, where it was like kind of this dream team for a little bit. And yeah. I don't know, maybe part of it was how new I was and how exciting all the new information was. Um, but you guys would do like these huge roundups of a ton of different knives, all with a certain theme. So it'd be like, if I wanted to learn about OTFs, you would have everything Microtech and everything Guardian Tactical and some Heretics and like all this, like, a variety on the table that even standalone reviewers typically don't have that much, <laughs> those many knives yeah, at disposal. Yeah. And uh, I think it's impressive that you being within a, a big retailer like that really leveraged the capabilities there. And that's something that I've been confused about as I've looked at some other, not trying to throw anyone under the bus or I, <laughs> a lot of retailers that I really like and respect. It's like, I wish they would, do more with YouTube being such this great avenue because they have all the knives there. They've got people on their staff, I assume, who are passionate about them, but it can be intimidating, I guess, for them to try to be that person who's putting yeah. it all out. It's it's not an easy game. And I it's funny that you you mentioned the mix of products because I felt like that was that was our unique selling proposition on YouTube. Yeah, we could make it funny. We could insert the memes and, and kind mm. of have personality. But at the end of the day, like the thing that we were sitting on is like thousands and thousands of knives and in inventory. And your average YouTuber, like you said, just doesn't have that kind of inventory to draw from. And uh, I mean, we I remember one time we were doing an OTF video and um, I wanted to include uh, Grant and Gavin Hawk's deadlock. Yes. Um, and I actually, I was like, you know, this isn't a knife that Blade HQ carried. Um, chances are they were never going to carry it because Grant and Gavin Hawk haven't been able to license it and the small runs, all these things. And um, I, I got in touch with Gavin and I'm like, Hey Gavin, do you have a deadlock that we can borrow? And he's like, no, I don't have a single one. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't like, surprise me at all. I'm like, dude, what, what are you doing? Anyway, he he reached out to a good customer. The good customer sent us one to borrow, and we were able to put it in the video. But, I mean, even that access to be able to text Gavin Hawk and be like, dude, Gavin, how can you help me? <laughs> you know, or, or to be able to text Joyce at Spyderco and be like, hey, what can you do for me? Like, And, and people, particularly when you're a big gorilla like Blade HQ, people jump when you give them an opportunity. Yeah. And so it, it was kind of this perfect storm. We had all this like creative juice flowing over here and we had all this access over here. And I think one of the big things about filmmaking is access. And yeah. so we, we just had almost the world at our fingertips. I will say though, I tried to do a Benchmade shop tour for like three years, never happened. Ah. Just got shut down. Um, that was an interesting one. And I actually think it's, if I had any regrets about Blade HQ, I, and it's not my regret, but I think it's regrettable that we weren't able to do a Benchmade shop tour. 
Hmm. Uh, particularly because Les Ass has passed away. And I think that there was a really good story that could have been told there. Um, yeah. And I, I wanted to tell it, but, uh, and, and I don't, I don't find that regrettable. I just think there are these really cool stories out there in the knife industry that should be captured in some sort of way, in a meaningful, meaningful way. Like there's a Sports Illustrated article out there. If, if you've never read it, you need to read it. It's like top five, top three knife reading of all time. It's about mm. Bob Loveless. It's written by a Sports Illustrated writer. And it is just fantastic. Uh, so I don't know if you do show notes, but it's worth worth reading and reading again. But it's just, it paints this picture of a knife maker in a way that is archive worthy. Like it should yeah. go in some sort of national archives because it, it tells the story of, of a piece of time in the knife industry. And that's super cool. So anyway, I'm waxing, waxing poetic here, but I just think that there are really cool stories to be told. And I've been grateful to be able to tell some of them. Uh, there's a few that I still am, am chomping at the bit to, uh, to tell. Yeah. But uh, I love the, I love the element of, of real people in a real industry. That's, that's super fun to me. No, I dig it. And I think, yeah, that's one of those things that, I, yeah, it's difficult to even formulate what the thought really is, but like standalone video YouTubers like myself or tabletop guys, and like there's this whole pool of knife reviewers on YouTube and it's great. I hope that there continue to be more and more like I love that. But that difference, like you said, really in a lot of ways can be access <laughs> um, and like budget even like to have a team of people and like the ability to just focus solely on that. Like a lot of people, if they have a YouTube knife channel, it's not all they do. <laughs> they have a day yeah. job and responsibilities. Yeah. And it costs them money. It doesn't make them money. And so to have a, a company like Blade HQ who took it seriously and takes it seriously to hire people whose job it is to run with that ball is really cool. And I think, I mean, the, the proof is kind of in the pudding. I, uh, a few months ago was with my brother-in-law who's doing SEO has been for a long time. And I was talking to him about a couple of knives that he should check out. Cause he's asking me what he should get. And I'm stoked. He finally, and now every day has a Civivi in his pocket, which is cool. Yes. Um, but he was like, as an SEO guy, he like Googles some stuff about knives. And he's like, Holy crap. Who is this blade HQ player in the game? Cause like it, in terms of clicks and ad traffic and, or just web traffic, all of that, it's like, off the charts compared to just about everybody else on the scene. And I think if I, from the outside looking in, had to kind of figure out a, a big part of that equation, the YouTube presence has got to be a, a big contributor for sure. Yeah. Let me, let me comment on that a little bit. I, I feel like in some ways I sort of walked into this beautifully made cake that I was able to just like put happy sprinkles on top of. <laughs> So, so they, even before I, before I started their SEO was really, really strong. Mm -hmm. um, just the way they built their site with the category structure and all of those things, they just had a really strong um, SEO base. And so they have 60% of their traffic and revenue comes from SEO. Mm. And so I kind of walked into this situation and I'm like, cool. Like, all we have to do is keep playing the same game in yeah. different verticals in different analogous verticals. And we're going to keep making money. So like we sat there and we tuned the SEO, we worked our tails off on that. But like when you have this great video, like it plays, so like automatic knives, super good keyword. Like mm -hmm. it play, we didn't just make a video about automatic knives. We made a video about automatic knives that tied into product pages and category pages and all these different pieces and parts. And so like, when you look at YouTube, YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. I think that might be changing a little bit with Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of product, like 60% of product purchases start on Amazon. But sorry, this is super technical. I This is not supposed to be I like love a super it. marketing. No, no. Okay, good, good. This is great. Um, anyway, so, so YouTube, second largest search engine in the world. And then what we started to see is they are, and you see this a lot now, um, YouTube is is doing their auto, um, gosh, what do they call it? Where they speech to text. So they're oh, doing yeah, yeah. auto speech to text and they'll actually link you to two minutes and 32 seconds in a video to give you an answer to your question. Mm -hmm. And so we saw this happening and we're like, dang, like 
we've got to keyword optimize these videos over here, embed them in the product pages, get the watch times, take the email marketing, point it to the video, make all these pieces and parts work together. Yeah. And that's where you're seeing Blade HQ everywhere. They had the SEO bit. I came in and I'm like, cool, that's there. Good cake. Let's put some pink frosting and some purple sprinkles on this thing and, and throw some birthday candles on. We'll have a regular party. And yeah. uh, that's kind of what I did. It was just like the, the foundation was there. And that's, that's one thing I, I always try to emphasize is like, Blade HQ was magical before I ever stepped in the door. The fact that they could get their get your orders out, they get things on time, their customer service is good. Like I I basically just came in and lit the thing, lit, lit some fire under a couple things and they blew up, which was really cool. That was a, a really stellar experience. Yeah. So, so for you, uh, I would assume based on the way that your life appears to me from the outside looking in now, mm -hmm. um, it's probably not realistic that you'll do that same kind of thing in the knife industry again. Would you take some kind of marketing role like that again? Or is it now that's a, a chapter in the past and more exciting things are in the future? Or how do you kind of look at all that? It's a, it's a really good question. I've kind of had a few opportunities come up over the, over the years. Um, I think the reality is I see more in my future than just like, here's the marketing dashboard, mm -hmm. but like, here's the whole, here's, here's the whole business dashboard. You know, it's, it's just yeah. bigger. Right. So like with my little business NAFs now, like we, we don't like it's, it's small, but we're doing things in a certain way that I like, like <laughs> to give you an example, I print everything for my NAFs business on craft paper. It's like, um, I don't know. It's thicker. <laughs> it's, it's thicker. It kind of has a cardboardy feel to it. Yeah. Um, and I, I print everything in Futura font, uh, Futura P PT. And that stuff, it sounds totally stupid, but I love it. I love the fact that I get to say, we print in this font. We print on this paper. We price it this way. We write notes on our orders. Like yeah. I love being able to almost end to end to control the process a little bit more. Just and like so, zero red tape anywhere. It's like whatever yeah, dude, you want on yes, the fly. Yes. Somebody asked me the other day, they're like, would, would you ever sell NAFs? And I'm like, ah, probably not, man. Like I don't want somebody telling me I can't put space kitty kitties on the side of a knife. Like, right. like that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense in a board meeting. Right. I, I love the fact that I have free reign over what I want to do and what I want to create. And the cool thing to me, just like, just, it's totally humbling is people look at a space kitty and they're like, oh, that's funny. And then they buy it. Like, <laughs> right. I don't know if you've seen the space. Have you seen the space? Oh, kitty? I've seen it. Yeah. yeah. Here, let's, if, if people don't know what I'm talking about, let me, let me pull one out here. Let me launch one up here on screen. <laughs> so this is, this is the space kitty banter. It has a kitten looking at a, a shuttle launch. And then on the other side, <laughs> You have a, a moonwalk with a kitty photoshopped into the uh, the space helmet, yes. and like you, I think even at a Blade HQ, if you take this and say, "Hey, I, I want to do this," there's hurdles, yeah. and I think Blade HQ, to their credit, is probably the best place in the world to put a space kitty or or something ridiculous. Like we did, we we put a mermaid on the side of a Victorinox. We we made a jackalope Victorinox. Yes. That stuff, dessert the dessert warrior. warrior. Yep. <laughs> I, I think it's one of the best places in the world to do stuff like that. But you still have to get it. You have to run it through people and convince people that it's a good idea, right? Um, I love the fact that I can just make whatever the heck I want. And yeah. sink or swim, I, I get to own that part of it. So I think it would be hard to kind of go back to a, within the knife industry, go back to a, a full-time marketing role where, Somebody says, hey, you can't do that because X, Y, and Z. And that's how businesses work, which is yeah. good. That's how they should work. No, but I get it. Is, and yeah. I think it makes sense. Like, I don't know, if you spend periods of your life getting from like an apartment to like a starter home, and then you get like a family home, if yeah. you were to then with the same size family or bigger later, try to cram back into that apartment, even if it worked at that phase and was exciting when you got it, like things change and you grow. And so I, uh, yeah. 
I, I, my, my question wasn't because like, I hope you'll take another marketing role. I'd rather see you take NAFs to the moon and, and go crazy <laughs> with that. I think that would be more fun Thank you. for me as an enthusiast in the community than like you being at another retailer or Blade HQ again or anything like that. But there was something special about the time you were there. So I think people oh, are probably I, curious. I agree completely. I, I think it was a, a very special time and it, it was just kind of, um, yeah, stars aligned uh, with the team and the opportunities and the the ecosystem and the climate. It just, it was awesome. I, I genuinely loved the experience. It was, it was very, very challenging, um, yeah. but it was, it was very, very rewarding too. Um, and you know, it's, it's funny. I, I never planned to be a, somebody, somebody said you're a very important person in the community, important member of the community. I, I never planned that, <laughs> you know, I, I don't think anybody shows up and they're like, Hey, I'm, I'm here to be important. <laughs> <laughs> if they do, they probably won't be. But, <laughs> probably. Yeah. But I, I think that we just, we did a lot of cool things like, um, at blade show, we Lawrence Ho of, uh, blade runner systems, BRS, we started, um, he and I started a thing called Bally comp. It was a competition for Bally song flippers. Mm -hmm. And again, access, like we, we were blade HQ and we could come in and we could say, Hey, we want to do this. And Alicia, the, the um, organizer at blade show, she's like, okay, what, what do you need? I'm like, I need a stage and I need a microphone and I need some stuff. And she's like, cool, we'll get it for you. But I think if it were just Ben walking in there, if it were Jake, just Jake walking in there, they'd be like, now, now who are you? It's less weight to throw around for sure. Oh yeah, totally. Totally. So it was a magical time for sure. And I, I think that there were some really cool things that came out of it. Yeah. So I have a kind of an interesting for me personally question for you. Um, when you were doing Blade HQ videos, I feel like there's a, a huge variety of personalities in the world. But then even within the microcosm of Knife YouTube, you get different personalities. Like I'm a very different knife reviewer than Nick Shabazz or Slicey Dicey or like you name these people like they're each pretty unique, but one of the things that I personally appreciated about the way you approached it was that you were approachable about it and you were always like transparent about the fact that you weren't, you haven't always been this huge knife guy and yeah. you did come to it through like a job, not through yeah. this pre existing passion. And when you didn't know things, you were open about like, I don't know the answer to that. Like it, it was very, sincere and yeah. humble, I'll say. And yes. I think it, it was also devoid of a lot of the like machismo <laughs> that sometimes comes yeah. in, in the world of knives. And yet you're one of the people who's most well-known and most well-liked that I'm aware of in the community. And so I think it's a good example of like, I don't know. I was talking to Slicey Dicey. We did one of these a week or so ago. And he was like, I live in New York and you're a hipster from Southern California. Like we shouldn't be the knife reviewers, but I have this conversation every now and then I feel like there are some loud, very macho dudes and like I'm secure in my manhood. I'm not trying to say that I'm effeminate either, but like it, it's this weird balance where I think some people expect everyone in the knife community to be like the manliest man possible and uh, completely into everything that has to do with manhood and only eats bacon and drinks whiskey and all this stuff. Right. <laughs> but you, you fly in the face of that. And so was that ever like a, a concern or a thought for you that like your videos weren't appealing to the, that crowd? I don't know how prevalent that crowd actually is, especially the more the time goes on, but was that a, a thought in your head? Um, not really. I, so the reason I ended up in front of the camera. So my, my background is broadcast journalism. Like I, I all through school. So I studied broadcast journalism and film um, mm -hmm. all through school. I was behind the camera and I loved being behind the camera. Like loved it. Just, I love telling the stories and I hated being in front of the camera. Well, at Blade HQ, like they needed somebody in front of the camera. Like they just, they needed a face to talk and they needed hands to talk about this stuff. And mm -hmm. I, I got to the point where I was just like so tired of working with people who didn't really want to be on camera because mm -hmm. it's hard. It's not easy. Um, 
and I got tired of like trying to coach them into functioning on camera. And I was yeah. like, forget it. I will do this. <laughs> like, and not in like a selfish way, but like I studied broadcast journalism. I, I studied film. Like I kind of had a, a sense, a trained sense of how to be okay on camera. And mm -hmm. so for me, it was just a matter of like, okay, do I want to do this? Am I willing to do this? All right. We, we need somebody. So in I go, you know, it's <laughs> there like, you go. I, I played football my freshman year of high school. I was, uh, let's see, there were five defensive ends. No, there were four, four. There were, no, there were five. Sorry. This is, this all makes sense in just a second. There were five. And what ended up happening is three of them like broke their hands or something like, <laughs> like they, they ended up injured. And I was like the fifth guy. And yeah. they're like, and they're like, you Peterson, you're going in, you're starting at <laughs> defensive end. And I'm like, Oh boy. <laughs> there you go. I wasn't, I wasn't very good, but, but Hey, I, I started for a, a little bit there. And I, I think in some ways that's kind of how I ended up on camera too, is we, we tried right. these other four people and it's not that they were bad. It was just like, they got stuff going on. One was the CEO, one was the marketing manager. This was back in 2012. And it just didn't work. Like they had problems that prevented them from working on camera. Well, and I was mm. just like, forget it. Like I don't have time in my life to try to coach all of this and make it work. So that's yeah. kind of how I ended up on camera. But I, I think that, yeah, the, the machismo, I just, I don't have a lot of it. Like, I'm, <laughs> like I'm just, I'm, I'm chill, man. I, I, uh, yeah, I've, I just, I drive a Toyota and I, I have a two car garage and I, I don't know, man, I pay my taxes. I'm just a dude. Yeah. And I, I think that that comes through on camera. Like I don't have much to like pump my, pump my chest about, uh, but I can talk about stuff and we can be chill about it. And I can be honest with you, you know, I think, yeah. and I think that's kind of what appealed to people is just the, the fact that I, I'll say what I mean and mean what I say. Yeah. So. There's a certain transparency to it. And I think it's approachable. It like yep. watching you on camera compared to the guys who really like are trying to portray a certain essence of themselves. It's like, I don't know. I, I, I find I engage way better with the people who I can tell are being pretty transparent. And after a while, when you, watch enough of somebody <laughs> and it's like hours and hours of seeing this person's mannerisms and hearing the way they talk. Like you get to be, you get to have this sense that you kind of get who they are. And yeah. especially when it's long form, that's part of why I like to make sure these are like at least an hour long and yeah. that they can oftentimes go super long because there's nowhere to hide when it's long form yeah. and you get to like actually see who people are. And so, yeah, I think, as I observed, like as just a viewer way before I had my channel watching the way that you approached being on camera and talking about things made me, especially as someone who was brand new at the time to like the depth of the hobby, I'd always carried knives, but I wasn't collecting them until that point I started buying stuff. It was like, yeah. this guy's not trying to be intimidating at all about it. He's just there and <laughs> talking about it. And you were engaging too and, and funny Thanks. and like sometimes at your own expense, you would make jokes and it was like, that's great to watch. It's enjoyable, you know? Yeah, man. I, I'm just chill. I like, I'm chill in the sense, like I get stuff done. It's, it's not like I'm like kicked back and like let the world happen around me. Right. I'm very right. determined and, and driven, but I also think I have a healthy sense of this is not heart surgery. And I, I always used to say that to the folks on my team. I said, this is not heart surgery. We're selling pocket knives. This is a luxury fun item mm -hmm. that people have a little bit of expendable income and they, they buy one, you know? And I just, I love that the, that kind of takes the pressure off of it. Right. Like we're not for, for the most part, 98, 99% of sales are to enthusiasts mm -hmm. uh, that 1%, 2% to operators. Like, let's be honest even the operators, like if they're using a pocket knife for self-defense, like something has gone horribly wrong. Right. And uh, I think most guys in the military, gals in the military are using knives to open MREs. They're opening knives to, to, they're using knives to open boxes or crates. 
And yeah, I think this idea of like an operator using a pocket knife is kind of a misnomer. Um, I just, and, and I, I feel like we kind of leaned into that a little bit. Like most guys that own Microtex are not downrange, plain and simple. (laughs) (laughs) And in fact, the guys that I actually sent a Microtech downrange to a friend who went to Afghanistan in the air force and he comes back with it and he's like, dude, this is like full of sand and I, I don't have the bit for this thing. You can't I'm disassemble like, it without that thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's sucks. like, this, this thing sucks. And I'm like, hmm, that's an interesting, interesting anecdote. But yeah, I, I always have tried to keep it approachable and accessible. Yeah, I dig that. So I feel like we should probably, for the sake of time, switch gears. We've talked a lot about Blade HQ and there's a lot to, I'm sure, unpack. I'm sure you've got loads of stories. <laughs> I probably need therapy from it. Yeah. <laughs> but you're, but now, now it's NAFs for you. Yeah. Right. And so um, I just recently got your banter. I've been sending you the videos as I've been putting them up. And uh, with that, I got your, the whole suite of the like shop rag and the little mini strop and all this stuff. And it's awesome. I love the fact that you take the time to create a product line around your product that can come with it. That's a lot of fun. Um, but other than the banter, because that's a knife and we'll talk about that. Has there been a like most fun project for you at NAFS? Is there anything that's been like the craziest or the wackiest or just the most enjoyable? Because I love that you're not just a knife, that you have a suite of products. Like, And then yeah. the knife came. It's really cool to me that that's the yeah, way Yeah, so, so let me talk about that just briefly and then let me answer your question. I feel like there are just so many stinking knives out there and so many different makers and companies and, and just it's saturated. Like that's the bottom line. And so looking at it as a marketer and looking at it as somebody who wants to make things that actually sell and people care about, I think creating this idea of a culture around a product is really important. You look at like the 940, you look at the Sabenza, there are people that just collect these the, the Kalashnikov, they're very, very passionate, not about, I, like take the Kalashnikov, for instance, I don't, I think there are more people passionate about the Boker Kalashnikov than there are about Boker in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> which is not a, which is not a knock on Boker, but I think there's this staying power to models and people mm-hmm. collect models. You you look at the Kershaw leak. You've got, I, I saw a picture one day, guy must've had 150 Kershaw leaks. It's crazy. Gold, rainbow, citrus yeah. color, like everything, right? A lot of guys I run with, it's the PM2 the, in the Spider Co. groups. It's everybody. Yep. There's people who have multiple of every sprint and exclusive uh, that has ever come out. And it's, yeah, yeah I get and it. It's like good for them, right? But how do you design something in this market that is just so like CRKT comes out with like 50 or 60 new models a year. Yeah. Uh, Kershaw, same thing. Benchmade comes out with about 10. Spyderco comes out with about 25, 30. Mm -hmm. So how do you create a product in this space that's just saturated with these knives that are discontinued, brought along? And like my whole thought process was like, you have to start thinking about it differently. And so that's where I actually released the mouse pad Mm -hmm. before ever even releasing the banter. Uh, People had been looking at the banter on their desk for eight months and asking me what knife is that? And I just, I just send them like a, like a sh emoji. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and they're like, Oh, and then when the banter released, they're like light bulbs. Right. Right. Because they've been looking at it in this mouse pad. Same thing with the, the um, poster you're looking at it on your wall. It's becoming part of your culture within, within knives. So that's part of what I think about in terms, even like the, the banter sticker that comes with the mm-hmm. banter. I want you to put that somewhere that you're thinking about this product because I'm going to drop another color here in a minute. And I want you to buy that color too. So it's, it's kind of my sneaky marketer brain uh, just, just playing with all of it. And that's kind of, that's kind of how NAFS has developed. Um, First was the white poster. You can see that one behind me. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was just like a super passion project. I had a lot of angst at the time and I just had to put it somewhere. And that was that. Sure. Um, So that was a super fun one, but I, I think, Watching the banter roll out, and not just the banter, but the poster, the mouse pad, all of the different pieces and parts, 
has been super rewarding. And where that's not that's not a NAS product, that's a Wii product. Uh, mm-hmm. But NAS has played such a supporting role in that in terms of just getting it in front of people, getting uh, products, analogous products in front of people. It's been really, really cool to um, yeah. kind of have that, that full scale launch. So I love that. So it, it, this is particularly interesting to me as, as we talk about this, because um, you probably haven't seen, I've just barely started teasing at it, but a buddy and I have designed a knife and we're working on, a production run that we just finally ordered our prototypes last night. Like the money is in the hands of Riet who'll be producing these knives. And it's this whole thing that's happening for us right now. And so it's, it's funny because I've become friends with Joseph Vero. Um, I've gotten to talk to like Brian Brown pretty extensively now after having him on the podcast and like figures like Joseph Vero and you and these certain makers who have in the last just like two years, done things pretty radically different, even within the realm of like micro brands, if you want to look at them that way, has been very instructional to someone like me who's trying to burst into it. And it's this funny thing where it's like, I don't at all want to do the same things that you're doing or the same things that Joseph Vero are doing or the same things that Brian Brown is doing. Like I need to be different than that. But it's funny because last night I had this long, like two hour long call with my partner, the buddy who I'm working on this with. Yeah. And we're talking about like packaging and getting crazy, just wacky, like letting ideas fly about things we can do that are different and haven't been done before and make an experience when you open the knife. And like these things to me are almost as fun as like the design of the knife itself. (laughs) So I I just, I dig it listening to you talk about that, how your whole process was like, it's not just about the knife. It's about the knives that come after it, the versions that come after it. And like, if you want to be anybody (laughs) in the space, you mentioned the number of knives that come out from these big companies who are already established. Like, that's not a, that's a David and Goliath story for the ones that actually kind of make it. So um, for you, do you have beyond the banter? Are there more models in your pipeline? I feel like you've hinted at that before. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's so I, I've been carrying one. I I can't show it yet. Um, Sure. But I, I'm really, really excited about it. It's, it's going to be a Civivi. Uh, so I've got a Civivi coming out probably they're saying Q3. So I'm, I've been telling people October. Um, Hmm. but yeah, that one's, I am really excited about that one. And I I hate to be like, ah, I'm so excited to not, not show it or tell it, but, um, (laughs) I I haven't been showing people details of mine yet. I've just started showing outlines. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I have that one coming. Uh, I have, so that one's done there. That one's in production. I have, um, Another one that I'm working on submitting to Wii that, uh, it, so the, the way I design knives, I, I don't think of myself as a knife designer. I think of an idea, like I assemble ideas mm. and I, I've had this idea for a knife for like a year. And, and then I, I buy knives that have features that I like and I mm. carry them and I'm like, Oh, this is not quite right. And so I, I have all this, these data points in my head. And mm-hmm. then I start drawing and sketching and I have one right now that it's in sketch phase. So I, I sketch an illustrator uh, or I'll, I'll freehand sketch it. And then I take it into illustrator and this one's an illustrator right now, but the blade to handle ratio isn't quite right yet. Mm. And so I'm, I'm working on that right now, trying to get Bumping that things right around uh-huh. yeah. Bumping things around and trying to get the mechanisms right. And I'm not a mechanical designer. So I'm just like sitting here going like, now, if the pivot rotates, like, it's just, it's yeah. wonky, man. You got to uh, get it real close and then let we figure out the actual details. No, that's, that's up. exactly yeah. what I do. And sometimes uh, I'll just like point, I'll put arrows on my, on my drawings and be like, guys, this isn't working. I, I know it's not. Can, can you fix it? And then they, they show me like their line drawings. And I'm like, yes, that, that yeah. right there. And I, I think that's kind of my MO. I, I'm a collector of ideas. I, I am a, an assembler, almost a producer in the sense that like I take something from over here and over there and put it together in a way that I think will work really well and it will sell really well. And so like, like the banter, for instance, I, I had a very specific way 
I was going to launch it before I ever designed the knife. Like I mm. had these steps and these places that I knew it would sell. And so uh, people always ask me like, how do I design a pocket knife? I, I think step one is figure out where the heck you're going to sell it. Who's going to buy it? Like, are you going to go direct to consumer? You're going to shoot it on Amazon. You're going to sell, sell it to Blade HQ. Well, why is Blade HQ going to buy it from you and sell it right. to their customer base? Like that's, that's the fun stuff to me. Like the knife design is, is great, but I like thinking about the nuances of who's going to buy this and where are they going to buy it and how much is it going to cost and why are they going to buy the next color and like all these pieces and parts. And so yeah. that whole process to me is just, it's invigorating because you get to design a micro world. Mm -hmm. And I love that process. Like at this point, the banter, the, the original banter, like I can't even keep up with the excitement around it. Yeah. Like on Instagram. And I, I feel bad because people post like every single day people are posting about it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I never saw that coming. Like I didn't like, I feel bad because I'm just like double tap, double tap, you know? And I just, yeah, like, I don't even have time right now to like sit down and be like, man, such a good shot. I love the Like I just have to keep moving because it's, yeah, it's kind of turned into its own little world, which is cool. It's that's, yeah, thing. it's fantastic to see. That's what you want. If you're like, especially if your goal isn't just to like make a knife to say you've done it, you know, like I like that yours was very long game. You were focused on way beyond a knife launch. It was multiple versions after multiple models after and this whole suite of posters and mouse pads and yeah. straps and strop wallets and all this stuff. And that you've been able to make it all flow together, I think yeah. is admirable. And I Thanks. assume a lot of that probably comes from having spent so much time doing what you did before. Um, yeah. That's a lot of insider knowledge, you know? <laughs> it, it really is. And somebody asked me once, like, how long did it take you to design the banter? I'm like, eight years, you know? <laughs> I, like, my, my wife was teasing me the other day because she, she, she actually asked me years ago, probably two or three years ago, she's like, what if you designed a knife? And I'm like, nah, that's not really my thing. Mm -hmm. But I think I got to the point where I'd, I'd kind of done all the things that were my thing. You know, I'd already made a bunch of videos. Uh, when our first video hit a million views, I was like, woo, first time ever. You know, like it was really cool. Like that's what I wanted. Yeah. Um, but I, I think designing a pocket knife has been a natural progression for me in terms of, I know this, 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 and this, but what about just beyond what I know? And what about just beyond that? And that's mm. where the knife design has been really challenging and rewarding for me. So. Yeah. So on the banter, I feel like I, the way my brain works for knives a lot of the time, even before I reviewed knives, I was always kind of looking for like, if I'm looking at a model, whether I have it yet or not, I kind of want to know what the like philosophy of use is. Like, is this an outdoor knife? Am I supposed to take this on week long backpacking adventures? Or is this like a pretty showy dressy gentleman's folder? Is this a tactical knife, which I think is a way overused term <laughs> on its own, but like, where does this knife slot? You know, like, what is it meant to be? And it's funny, uh, the way I look at the banter, and I could be wrong compared to what you designed it for, but I've said the term now, I think in both of my videos, where I look at it as like a dad knife. Um, because yes. that's my favorite, man. Because I love that. You, you're like a dad and your whole like reach and touch the tip uh, thing is very like, I'm doing crafts with my kids. And it's just like kind of unassuming, not uh, too aggressive looking, even in this all murdered out black one. It's like, it's not a scary looking knife. It's a size that's capable without being like robust for no reason. It's a good slicer. Like it's an EDC knife, but it's like a dad's EDC knife. Like I want to have this knife in my pocket when I'm wearing my white New Balances. Like that's the way <laughs> I feel about it. Yes. And you're in Crocs <laughs> with your kids using this knife. You know, like it, it clicks in my brain, but <laughs> there you go. Would you say like... It, how would you define the philosophy of use of the, the banter if you were to <laughs> encapsulate it? I love it, man. That makes me laugh. Every time <laughs> you say dad knife, I just laugh because I, I think you nailed it. I, so uh, I'll cut paper with it in church with my kids, right? Like they'll sure. draw a little, I'll draw them a dinosaur and I'll cut it out and be like, here kid, be quiet. Yep. Um, and like, I think that's kind of how my knife preferences are born. You know, it's like, but I also go backpacking, I go hiking and I, I kind of wanted, 
call it a Goldilocks knife for me. Like you can take this backpacking and it's going to perform. You can yeah. cut an apple with it and it's going to perform. Yep. Um, are you going to be able to like whale on it? No. Are you going to be able <laughs> shouldn't to shouldn't be batoning with it? No. Correct. Are you going to be able to smash through a car door in a, in a wreck? No, probably not. You probably want a <laughs> hammer or something for that. Right. Right. So I, I see it as like, philosophy of use there is it's like a screwdriver man i i just i look at it as a cutting tool mm -hmm. in in the finest sense of the the term it shouldn't be crazy like you look at a screwdriver and it's got in fact let me let me just pull a screwdriver and let's let's talk about this for a minute <laughs> i love it let me let me pull the most generic stanley screwdriver of all time i feel like there i have held that exact screwdriver before for sure i i think everybody has held this screwdriver uh stanley usa the 64864 um ah good model yeah i know you, that one you, well you, <laughs> you look at what's happening with this screwdriver it's total function right the the handle has areas that you can grip so that you can torque right it's like fluted yeah yeah it's it's fluted right in there it's got a little bit of is it Jimping, I'd call it jimping. A little sure. bit of jimping in there. It's got a lanyard hole. So if you're using this on a boat, you can you can throw a, a loop in there. Mm -hmm. uh, everything about a screwdriver is function driven. And I think sometimes we forget that with pocket knives because they've turned into pocket jewelry. And, sure. and that's not a bad thing, right? But I think if the role of the screwdriver is to screw things in, make it so it works like that. Uh, I look at kind of these art knives out there and sure they're a cutting tool, but man, I don't, I don't want to dirty up my Damascus. You know, right. I don't want to, I don't want to hurt my titanium, my Thai, Thai mascus, Moku Thai, whatever. Yeah. And I, I, I wanted the banter to be a screwdriver, uh, just a simple knife. Don't, I don't actually use it as a screwdriver, please. If you're listening. Yeah, correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> I wanted it to be analogous to a screwdriver. There you in go. that you can you can use it for cutting tasks. It's going to slip right in your pocket. It's going to not be poking out of your pocket. It's not going to tear your pants apart. I hate when knives tear my pants apart. Same. Um, that was one of the one of the very few things that we changed from the original prototype to to this uh, version. Now we changed the pocket clip just a little bit. Mm. Uh, gave it just a little bit more height and changed the angle just a slight bit because. The tip of the pocket clip can actually tear up the jeans too. If it's yep. too um, flush with the handle, too low, as it yeah. goes in, it's sitting there pound it. You basically have to pound it into the jeans versus sliding it into the jeans. So mm -hmm. that was kind of my, my philosophy of use is create something accessible, create something that anybody could carry and feel comfortable about the screwdriver of knives. So, and do you think, so as you, continue on with more models say we're not even just what you're working on right now but like in the yeah. future of ben designing as nafs do you think you'll stay within that similar vein or does a part of you want to eventually get to like now i am going to make the ultimate tactical knife or now i am going to make the ultimate outdoorsman's hunting skinning folder or like do you see yourself deviating from that or is is your focus going to stay very like knife for you that what you want to have in your pocket daily you know i have a hard time selling what i don't believe in mm. um i think it would be challenging for me to design a hardcore tactical knife <laughs> Same. with yeah. with without having some sort of reason or story right like i right. I'm just throwing this out there. Like, I think if I were to become friends with somebody who was in the military and they're like, Hey, I wish I would have had this, you kind of mm. create this problem to solve. And I could see myself designing a tactical knife. Mm. But if I were to just drop what I thought would be great in, in the sandbox, like, I just don't think, I don't think it, it would have soul. And yeah. I, I think I, I try to design things with soul. So to answer your question, I, I don't think so. Um, I'd like to design kind of a fixed blade uh, backpacking knife. I, I typically mm. take the Azula uh, backpacking, but there are things about Azula it one or Azula two, the one, the one. Okay, I have a two that I carried on my day pack, like vertical, oh. right here for years, yeah. and now I have a BGM custom uh, 
it's his pike model that I keep there, but that Azula served me super well, yeah. really, really well. Yeah. So it's, it's not a great slicer though. It's a really thick stock. Um, yeah. And so I, I think taking the idea of an Azula and saying, well, what could be better or different about this? Um, mm. I don't like the fact that you can't strike on the back of it because it's got the powder coating on it. Um, right. the, the 1095 steel kind of, you, you have to baby it, you know? Um, but there's concessions there, right? Price points and coatings and all, there's all these concessions. So I think at some point I'll probably design a fixed blade. Uh, it's not on my roadmap at the moment, but that's yeah. kind of the sort of stuff I look at and it's like, okay, here's a problem that I'd like to solve. And that's kind of where a design or an idea comes from. I like that. And I think the best designs almost without fail come from people who are designing something that they really, really want. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And you can just kind of tell, right? Because it, it seems so genuine and that's where the stories come. And yeah, I dig that. Also remind me offline to ask you about hiking places because I'm coming up Ooh. to Utah next month and I plan to do some hiking while I'm up there. So Ooh. call me. Deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so for you, um, your typical tasks are pretty like paper, fruit, cardboard, like basic general knife guy stuff. General I, white male suburban tasks. Yes. Sure. And <laughs> same tasks. with me. Like I have certain knives that I consider to be kind of outdoor knives, right? Like yeah. if I am going hiking for the day and I'm putting a folder in my pocket, it's overkill already because I have a fixed blade on my pack. But oftentimes it'll be like something crazy, like the Demco 8020 with the shark lock, because it's like this knife can, I mean, you could dig a hole with it and it would be fine. Um, <laughs> so like there's something fun to that. But I think there's something really genuine about your approach where it's like, I'm going to build the tool that's really good at what I want to do with it. And then you make sure it actually is good at that thing. And you make those little edits like the pocket clip. So if there's something on it that bugs you, you've addressed it and it's like, it's right. Do you feel like there's a moment on a design where you feel like it's ready? Or is that like an impossible thing to like chase? <laughs> I, I mean, like when I'm drawing something, it's hard for me to stop. If I, if I get to a certain point and sometimes I should have stopped 10 minutes ago, other times there is more to do it. Do you find that you can find that zone? Yeah. So I, what I've been doing a lot lately is I, I find myself sketching once, twice, three times, four times, five times. Basically I'm, I'm fleshing out the idea um, mm. in terms of, Oh, what features do I want on it? What should it feel like? What should it look like? Um, you'll laugh. My, my process right now, I, I don't have a 3d printer. I don't even know how to use CAD because I don't either. I, just, <laughs> I don't have time right now, but, um, my process right now, I have a, I have a label printer, like a shipping printer. Sure. And I design an illustrator. I print the print, the design on the label printer. So pretty much guaranteed. I'll never have a knife over six inches because that's how long the, <laughs> the labels are. Unless you're printing it in components and sticking <laughs> yes. it together. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll print it on the printer and then I'll, I'll actually take the sticker, cut the sticker out, slap it on a piece of cardboard that's dual layered and hold it. Out. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's me. And then I'll, I'll hold it in my hand so I can have a better sense of what would this feel like? How does it, how conceptually would it feel? Mm. Um, and I feel like that's a process too. So I'm, I'm sketching five or six iterations. I'm taking one into Illustrator. I'm manipulating it in Illustrator, making sure the pivots uh, works and the rotation is right. Mm -hmm. and then I'm printing it out and saying like, is this right? Is it not right? Uh, I just, I was working on a model uh, with TJ Swartz um, a couple weeks ago and uh, I sketched it out, sent it to him, sent it to him. He did all the CAD work and then sent me a 3D print of it. Mm. And I, I just keep them at my desk and play with them on Zoom calls because I'm on yeah. a lot of calls. And uh, it just wasn't quite right. And so I went back to TJ and I said, look, we got we to gotta widen this handle just a hair mm. and change this just a little bit. And you can feel that. And I, I don't know, like I couldn't take out a set of calipers and say like, hey, this needs to be 300 thousand wider. Like mm. that's, not my, that's not my jam. I, yeah. There's a feeling to design. And I can tell you when it's right and I can tell you when it's wrong. And uh, it, it's kind of this idea that I'll know it when I see it. And mm. uh, 
that won't make me a good author, but I think it will allow me to, uh, to draw, to create things, you know? And I, yeah. I think that there's a, there's a feeling within a product. I don't know if it's golden means or what, I'm not a mathematician, but there's something that when it's right, it's right. Yeah. So. Yeah. I have a buddy who I talk to just on Instagram a lot. We've we're in a group chat together and we'll DM one-on-one. -on -one. And a few months ago, he kind of issued a challenge to like a group of us in a DM to pick our top 10 knives in our collection, but to do a very specific process in doing so and to make sure that we laid every one of them out. And before eliminating anything, we would pick it up and feel it and orient it in our hands, open it and close it. And so it's not just your memory of like how this knife feels or how you remember it being right, but that you're in the moment as you're eliminating things, you're, you're having a tangible experience with them as well. And, uh, I think you're dead on like for the knife that I've been working on, our first 3d print was not correct. <laughs> um, there was a, a major change that happened during that 3d print. And even just to get to the point where we were ready to 3d print, there was a lot of stuff where we were like using wood on a skill saw to make like <laughs> kind of yeah. haphazard models and like uh, having something to hold makes all the difference. So I like that that's part of your process because there are a lot of knives I've found in reviewing that look stunning and like in photos and video, I'm super drawn to them. And then you get it in hand and it's just something, even if it's good, it's like there can be something about it. That's not sparking. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And or that's even, important. Even like the grind on it, right? Like if the, yeah. if the grind is too thick behind the, behind the edge, it's going to like, it, it won't slice an apple. It will crack an apple. Correct. And for me, I like, I need the apple to slice. Like I, I, I can't hand a quarter of an apple to my kid. I'll bent up. Like they're going to hand it back and be like, dad, my kid makes know? me peel it first and then slice it cleanly. Yeah. <laughs> man, those, those Southern California kids should have <laughs> known. <laughs> oh man. But, I blame yeah. That's <laughs> no, that's, I think you're dead on is, and it's interesting too, because there are, I, I watched, are you a Harry Potter fan? Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. So, uh, Ollivander's wand shop, right? Mm -hmm. Harry Potter walks in there, book one, he gets his wand, the wand, choose the maker, that sort of thing. I think that idea works with pocket knives too, mm -hmm. because everybody's hand is just a little bit different. I I've watched people hold knives and I think, wow, that's, that thing fits great in my hand, but I'm watching it in your hand and it's totally wrong. Mm. And I think that's, I, I talked about the oversaturation of the industry. And I think in some ways that's part of what's driving the oversaturation is, is people understand, Hey, this, this knife might not be for everybody, right? Like I look at a yeah. Medford, like Medford is not my brand. It's a great example. That's a there, one, one place where some YouTube fanboys in my comment section have been real, real mad when I've reviewed some Medfords. <laughs> Yeah, and, and more Not power for me. to them. If, if that is the knife that fits your hand and you're happy about it, right? that's, that's great. Like that's, and, and I tell people when people are dogging on the banter, I'm like, it's, it's a beautiful time to be a knife collector because if you hate the banter, there's 40,000 other knives out there that you'll probably like better than the banter. And yeah, then maybe the Praetorian is the answer for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's not, great. But that's not the answer for me, right? Yeah. So I, I, I love it. It's, it feels a little bit like this renaissance of, of knife options, uh, mm -hmm. just a, a smorgasbord of, of opportunity out there. So that's my favorite part about it. It's like every, there's something for everybody. There's weird yeah. pockets of friends and family and, and knives to be had. Yeah. And it's doing a really cool thing for like, virtually every price point as well at driving up quality yeah. and bringing in features and the variety, like, because there's so much there. I don't know. I was talking to a buddy not too long ago um, about, I forget what it was. We we're talking about a knife that used to be very popular and still is. And I don't necessarily agree should be. And he was explaining why he thinks it is. And I was like, okay, yeah, but you can't, you can't say that and not tell us what knife it is. Oh, I've, I, I've talked a lot about the Sebenza personally, for me, that's the one that I think is a 2005 star, maybe stretching to like 2009, that knife was one of the best on the market. But to me now, like for what I prefer in a knife, I'm not saying they're not nice. I'm not even saying they shouldn't charge what they do. I'm just saying like, to me, 
the type of action I prefer, the type of ergos I prefer, the weight that I prefer, like all of these things coming together, there are places where I can get all of those components exactly the way that I like them. And so to me, it's this golden time where it's like, I don't have to pick a knife that just looks cool, but the ergos suck. There are plenty of knives where they look phenomenal and the ergos are amazing and they have a great grind and the action is fun. And it's like, at a certain price point, you might have to pick two or three, not like five <laughs> of like your yeah. ultimates. But once you touch like 300 bucks in the knife world right now, you can get everything and good materials. <laughs> and it's like, it, it's a wonderful time to be a consumer in it because oh. you just have so much buying power to get a, a lot that's kind of seemingly trickled down that used to be much more difficult to obtain. Yeah, I agree completely. I agree completely. So yeah. let me ask you this, Jake. I, I haven't watched, I, I've watched a smattering of your videos. What's your, what's sure. your, what's your grail knife? What's, what's the knife that really gets you going? Sure. So that I own currently, my favorite knife is my Koenig Arius and has been the entire time I've owned it. I had a gen three before and I sold it um, because I felt bad that I never carried it. And then I came to a point about the time that I started my channel like a year ago where I was like, I need to get another Arius and this time I'm just going to make myself carry and use it. So I did. So now I have a Gen 4 and this is a knife like any other knife in my collection that I will carry. I will use to cut whatever is in front of me. If it's the knife in my pocket, I'm not running to find another knife. <laughs> this is a knife. Um, and then I just got on the books for, I don't know if you're familiar with Oz Machine Company. Um, mm -mm. Daniel Osborne. He's a newer guy. He's only been making, I don't know, maybe a year and a half, something like that. But he does this model called the Roosevelt. It's the only knife he makes so far. And he does these batches of book spots. And I had a loaner of his knife like five months ago or so. And it was the first knife since the Arius that I've liked as much as it. And I was yeah. like, I have to get one of these. But they base at like 500 bucks. And on the secondary, they're like 1500 plus. It's wild how much they're, because you can't get them, you know? Yeah. And so I'm not the guy who plays the secondary game like that. I'd rather wait yeah. years for a book spot. <laughs> and even then, I don't even really dabble in customs all that much. But this one finally like spoke to me. So just last week, I finally got honest books for the hundred spots that he opened up. And uh, within a few months, I'll, I'll finally have a Roosevelt from Oz Machine Company. That's my other like, grail but at this point with the channel i also just buy a lot of really exciting stuff all the time and then i also sell and trade really exciting stuff all the time because i'm always cool. just trying new stuff so my collection remains pretty fluid but that's cool do you I, have a find... do you have a grail is there one for you um not really to be honest i i think the knives that i i want i have in one form or another, I think sure. that, uh, and, and, and I guess maybe my grails are the ones that I would like to make, but mm. haven't been able to yet. I, there's, there's an idea I have out there floating in the ether <laughs> that I think would be really cool, but I, I don't think if it, it may never happen. It's one of those, like, ah, this would, be, this would be awesome. If it's that exciting, then it definitely needs to happen. Yeah, but but I also like there's there's like limitations to that, right? So, yeah. and, and I'm not a knife collector. Like I always, people ask me like, how many knives are in your collection? And I'm like, well, <laughs> like I've got these ones from this period. And like, I think I counted them. I think I've got like 60 or 70, mm -hmm. but like, I don't see myself as like this collector looking right. for something in particular. I'd imagine um, a lot of those also were probably like given to you over time and just amassed yeah, we, them. we, we call it given. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, Taken. they might they, they may have just arrived, you know? <laughs> sure. But I mean, yeah, it's no, different when you're like, when you're hunting for things and you get them, you yeah. look at them differently than when they just happen for you because oh, like, totally. I mean, when I worked in automotive aftermarket, it was like getting a set of wheels and tires for my car because they were takeoffs from a photo shoot we did wasn't that crazy, but like I'd appreciate those wheels and tires more for sure. If I shopped for them and paid full price for them yes. and bought them and it was like this experience, right? So when knives are just handed to you, it's not always the same. Although yeah. sometimes it can be more meaningful on the contrary when it's like 
a true gift and special in that way. But sorry, I didn't totally. mean to get no, off no, in the no. weeds. No, I, I love it. And and I think that's kind of why I don't really have a grail. Like I I collect knives with stories and, mm -hmm. and whether that's like somebody gave it to me or it just kind of came to me or whatever, like those are those are fun stories to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I enjoy that process of almost collecting items with stories versus just something that I went and diligently shopped for and, and then eventually got. I did um, yeah. But as far as like makers or grails or anything, like I, I don't really have like a bucket list. It's, it's interesting. Like I think given the opportunity, if, if one came my way, I'd probably take like a can onion custom or a Burnley mm -hmm. custom or like a, a Kit Carson custom. But the reality is like, I, I just don't, I don't know that I, I, I'm not collecting them to have them. I'm collecting, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm collecting them when they come to me. Uh, to give you an example, Jared Ozer lives down the street from me. Mm -hmm. uh, not this street, but down the road. Sure. Um, and he makes just the most beautiful knives, beautiful materials. And I said, Jared, one day, one day I got to get one of your knives. And he's like, well, here, like, let me put you on the books. And I was like, no, that's... <laughs> I don't know. It, it, like, I don't just want to throw money at it and have it, you know, like, sure. Like I want to, I want a story behind it somehow, you know, and, and that's a, that's a weird thing. That's not me, Jared, if you're watching this, this is not me asking for anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but I want it to have some sort of meaning for me personally. And that's kind of how I, how I find things and keep things. Um, so I yeah, like that. long answer, but uh, that's kind of my philosophy. No, I think that's like, it's commendable in a sense, because for a lot of people, knife buying is like this bottomless pit, right? And they're trying to like find the thing that is finally the perfect DDC or like checks all their boxes perfectly. And I don't know that for many people that actually really exists. I've found it like for moments, like the first time I got the Arius is like, I didn't buy a knife for longer than a typical, <laughs> the, the distance between purchases got real big because nothing seemed all that alluring anymore when this was like, I'd made it, you know, but I think the idea, like you already have knives covered, like you have knives around you yeah. that you can put in your pocket and cut the things you need to cut. And so for like what are, every day of the year. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So what you're not trying to fill a void. You're just trying to like, allow yourself to be open to having cool experiences and meet cool people and have there be meaning behind it. I think that's commendable. I think it's a, yeah. a good way to look at it. And uh, as somebody who's hoping to sell knives and you who is already selling knives, maybe we shouldn't be too loud about telling people to slow down and just buy knives that have cool stories behind them. But do you know um, though, I, I kind of, I don't know if you follow Peter McKinnon. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so Pete has just purged his knife collection. I think he went from like 40 or 50 knives and purged most of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's sending me these update texts like, hey, got rid of like 10 more today. And I'm like, is everything okay over there? <laughs> you know. But I, I think he's on this kick where he's getting rid of camera gear and he's getting rid of collections of things mm -hmm. because like the, the reality is uh, your stuff can begin to own you. I mean, I, even I look around my garage and I'm like, dang it, I need to clean this. There goes a yeah. Saturday, right? And so I think if you can manage your consumerism in a way that makes sense and isn't overkill, I mean, if, if knife collecting is a hobby for you, cool, knock yourself sure. out. But if you're just impulsively buying knives, like maybe the Peter McKinnon route where you're purging your collection and making a decision about what is going to be the thing in your pocket, that could be a really good thing for you. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think there's something to be said about minimalism and, and kind of, boiling things down to the essentials. And that doesn't have to be a banter. It can be whatever knife, right? Like you don't right. need 20 pocket knives, bottom line. Yeah. And I'm a Absolutely. guy that sold, I've sold a lot of pocket knives, but the, <laughs> yes, I, I think we all have to be realistic about our consumption of things. You know? Right. So. Yeah. Last night or two nights ago. So we're filming this on a Wednesday and this morning, my podcast went live with Thomas Moore. I don't know if you know, Thomas. I do know Thomas. Yeah. Guy. Yeah, Love him. Spider He's great. Guy. When I was up in Portland last, I actually met up with him and we spent an afternoon hanging out and he took me to his burger spot and it's like, he's a great guy. And uh, just in the last like week, he has sold like 80 or 90 Spyderco's 
that he had that were all just in a safe. And he still has his core, like his knives. These were just knives that were in boxes that he never even thought about that he just had as like extras. And the way he's described how like freeing it is not just to like get the mon the money back out of them. That was, <laughs> that was not liquid <laughs> while it was sitting in the safe, but to, to relieve the stress of just like, that's a thing that isn't in his life anymore. And he doesn't have to worry about it's, I think there's something to that. So I don't know, oh, maybe hey. one of these days I'm going to start selling all my stuff for in a fit of minimalism, but I don't know. I, uh, I, I, I think this, so I, I just a, a side note on that. I, I went through kind of a, we were living in a tiny apartment in Oregon when I worked at CRKT and mm -hmm. like if, if we didn't practice minimalism, like we'd have stuff everywhere. So like, we were constantly like cleaning out the closets and being like, have I worn this in a year? And like just getting rid of it. And yeah. I, I actually think it's, it's a pretty good process, especially when you live in a small space, just to say, you know, what do I need here? What do I use here? What don't I use here? Mm -hmm. And I, what does, what does Marie Kondo say? Does it spark joy? <laughs> I, I don't, uh, to me, it's not so much, does it spark joy, but do I see myself using this? Is there utility to it still? Yeah. Is there utility to it still? You know, I've, I've got a badminton set over here in the shelves that like, literally it's been good for nothing except for like the kids smacking each other. But I, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, that's, that's waxing philosophical, but I, I think that it applies to pocket knives in that if you can control your consumerism like there's cool opportunities that you can do. And I'm, I'm kind of an experienced guy. I like to, I would much rather take a pocket knife hiking than spend two hours shopping for a pocket knife. So. Yeah, no, I, I like that. So we're now we're past where I said we'd tie a bow on it. So um, <laughs> to kind of conclude, I have maybe a final question yeah. for you. Um, if you were to encapsulate what kind of figure you are, in the knife community? Like, are you a collector? Are you an enthusiast? Are you a designer? Are you a, like, what title would you put on what you are? Because I can't think of what I would put on for you. And so I'm genuinely curious, like, how, is it possible for you to view yourself and put a word or a sentence to that? That's a good question. Uh, genuinely, I, I don't have a good answer for you. I, I think maybe the best word is creator. Hmm. Um, I'm a creator of ideas and an executor of ideas. So that could be a knife idea. That could be a video idea. That could be a mouse pad, a website. Uh, I love to create. And so, yeah, I mean, you could tack on influencer, you could tack on knife designer, video personality, marketer, industry insider, whatever. You've done a lot of uh, things. <laughs> I have. Um, yeah. but, I, but I think ultimately all of the things I've done, if you were encapsulated in a word, I'm, I'm a creator of, of things. And, and that's ideas, experiences, products I create. So. I like that. No, I think that's a great answer. From going from starting with, I don't have an answer for that, to, <laughs> to going there. You answered my question perfectly. Well, I'm, um, I'm a, what am I? I'm, I'm just great at podcast interviews, Jake. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm good at. <laughs> it's a creative exercise, okay? Uh, awesome. Well, so on YouTube, I will have your links listed down below. Cool. But for people who are listening on podcast platforms, can you explain to people where they can find you if they want to see website, social media, like where yeah. you find Ben? Yeah, so you can find me at Ben underscore banters on Instagram. You can find me at benbanters.com where I muse about things. You can find me at nafs.com where I create products. And you can find us at nafs underscore co on Instagram if you want to follow the latest and greatest weird stuff. Uh, but yeah, we got all the other platforms and stuff, but mostly website and Instagram is kind of the, the high priority right now. I think We've got all the YouTube accounts and stuff, but we don't really put out a ton of stuff out there right now. Mm -hmm. But those are the places, Ben Banters. So. Perfect. And shout out to Athena who runs the NAFS Instagram from what That's I get. That's my wife. She is super nice. I really like her. <laughs> she is amazing. I So she and I are 50-50 on, uh, like 50-50 owners on NAFS. And yeah. uh, for the first year and a half, I was like, man, you run the books, but what else do you do? <laughs> like In the nicest way possible. And finally, I think she caught the vision of 
what we were trying to accomplish. Come here, come hop in here. She, she is she right out. there? She just walked. She literally walked out as I was insulting. Her. I thought she was I, listening I, the I whole bad. time, and I was like, "Why is she not was, sitting my nose, there?" My ears were twitching. <laughs> Hi, Athena. Here, you can't hear very oh, well, but sorry. Um, yeah, so so Athena jumped in as the manager of all the things that I ran out of time to do. So I, I think about the time I started our Instagram account. Mm-hmm. It was like I'm out of time, and so. Rumor has it I've got a partner in this business. So this is what would happen. I'd be like, hey, shouldn't we start an Instagram? And he's like, you're right, we should. (laughs) I love it. And I tip my hat to you because genuinely you do a phenomenal job at it. And Thank you. That's very kind of you. Yeah, you guys give great attention to not just Ben's profile, but to NAFs. And I know that that's a lot to juggle to have a site that's needing content, to be doing content that's going visually on Instagram, handling all of the DMs. Like that's a, a sincere effort. Plus you guys are shipping tangible products. So I, I, I commend you. you on it. It's insane, but I, I have a good business process. partner. It's, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think Ben could do it all better, but he just doesn't have the time. So I just make it happen. <laughs> She's I amazing. It. I bet Athena is actually the, the genius creative here. Do, do you know what? I, I All the things we just talked about, like... <laughs> no. no it, she's amazing. It, it's the reason though, you know, initially he talked about how I was pregnant for the first year and a half or morning sick and had a new baby. And it, I kind of was like, well, if he can keep this afloat by himself for a year, then I'll dump it himself, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> I like it. I dig that strategy. All right. You played the cards correctly. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to talk to you, Jake. Hey, yeah. pleasure's all mine, Athena. I'm Thank glad you, you walked Thanks by so. at the right moment. <laughs> <laughs> she heard me talking about her. Had to come defend herself. <laughs> now I think one of those earbuds was her feeding you answers the whole time. I, I wouldn't. Yeah. <laughs> she She's amazing. I, uh, yeah, I, I should probably, it's been interesting, just as a side note here at the end of this, uh, we kind of made the decision to keep our family out of all the pieces and parts of our business. Mm-hmm. And her included, I think um, there were a lot of opportunities, even at Blade HQ, to potentially bring in family members. And we kind of made that decision not to. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's about a year ago, we we sort of made the decision that like, hey, we need help here. <laughs> and so we yeah. kind of brought it. Uh, Athena said, I, I can do this. And and so she dived in and, and she's awesome. Like, yeah, I, I married up, man. I, I really did. <laughs> I dig it. As did I. Don't don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Uh, Well, awesome, Ben. This has been super fun. I genuinely appreciate you taking the time. We uh, we went a little longer than I even planned on. But no, thank you, Jake. This has been a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure is all mine. So yeah, hopefully, somewhere down the line, we'll do this again. Whether something new comes out or you just want to come on, you're welcome anytime. And uh, yeah, I'll be looking forward to it. Everybody, this has been episode number 14 already. We are calling it Bearded Banter. Uh, that's going to be the title. I'm going for it. Uh, thank you so much. And we'll uh, we'll see you all on the